I mostly use four third sensors. And why is that? Okay, why, why do I use mostly four third sensor? I'll answer that in this video. Well, let me give you my astrophotography reason. My astrophotography reason is that it's just interchangeable with everything that I have, okay? It doesn't matter what telescope or what optic I put a fourth third sensor behind, I know that it will work with it. With a larger sensor, this APS-C sensor here, some of my equipment doesn't work with that camera. And so I can't just willy-nilly toss it around from one telescope to the next. And I, that's actually, maybe that surprises a lot of you that telescopes don't have a big enough image circle most of the time for APS-C or 35 millimeter for that matter. And there's a reason why I call it 35 millimeter and not uh, full frame. This APS-C, sure, it's great. I like big sensors, but big sensors also have challenges that come with them. They're harder to use, okay? And I don't mean by like bigger and bulkier and stuff like that. I mean that like <laughs> there's just a whole heck of a lot more stuff that you got to worry about with these sensors. You got to worry about tilt, you got to worry about the calibration of your optics. All of this stuff becomes extremely critical and most of you wouldn't dare to ever try to calibrate a refractor, okay? And you know what? With a larger sensor, Sometimes you've got to do that in order to get everything you can out of it. Furthermore, most people, you know, they abuse larger sensors. They take flats and with a larger sensor, you just, you have to take really good flats, okay? Flats are the most difficult form of calibration frame that there is. And you go to any of the forms and you will just see a massive number of people asking questions about their flats. And I know I've got personal friends. They ask me about flats all the time. And you know what? A lot of times I don't take flats because I use a sensor with a telescope that fits the sensor, right? It's a sensor that's not too big because when it gets too big, well, then you have vignetting. You have to take flats to compensate for that. And essentially, if the vignetting is too much, if it's over about 20%, which I think is excessive, 20% vignette. Well, guess what? You, uh, <laughs> you have to stretch the corners of your frame more than the center, and that means that noise creeps in around the edges of your picture faster, and if you're doing a picture with nebulosity everywhere in the picture, which you know most of advanced astrophotographers like myself do, well, then guess what? <sighs> it means you have to do more integration time. So the whole idea that, oh, you're capturing more light with a bigger sensor is kind of out the window here. So that's the astrophotography reason as to why I use primarily four-thirds cameras. It is just easier. It's compatible with everything that I have. And yeah, I don't have to take flats all the time. You know, which is a huge boost to me because a lot of times I would miss an image if I had to take flats that night. Now let's talk about the daytime photography. Okay, now, now I'll tell you this right now. I started with film, okay, which this is 35 millimeter. This is not full frame. This is 35 millimeter. This is what I started with. This is back in the day when I first did astrophotography. This was the camera to get, okay. You know, digital wasn't really even a thing. Uh, the E1 wasn't even out yet. I don't think the E1 came out until about three or four years later. Most serious astrophotographers were still using film. And most of the time you were using camera lenses that were designed for that camera, okay? Now, when the E1 came out, of course, I went all in. You know, I was faithful to Olympus in that respect. And I've done a video about the E1 and why I think it was a failure. So, so we won't dive into that. If you want to see that, go watch that video. But the format, the format itself, there's nothing really terribly wrong with the format, all right? But I will tell you this, there have been several times in my professional career where I was kind of a little bit ashamed of my equipment. For example, when I was using the E3 here, this was my main state camera. Uh, at the time, Olympus did have the E5 out, okay? I was asked by my boss at the college I worked at, because I was the staff photographer for the college, you know, he noticed that I use Olympus gear. And he said, you know what? Would you like us to sell all of our Nikon stuff and go Olympus? 
And I actually had to look him in the eye and say, no, it's not good enough quality. You know, uh, at the time it wasn't good enough. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of, I was honest about that. And I, but I continued to stick with Olympus because I knew that eventually they'd catch up in some ways. And they did, of course. When the EM5 came out, that was really close. I was actually really tempted to say to my boss, hey, we should, now would be a good time to dump Nikon and go four thirds. Especially since, I mean, there were some things that Olympus cameras did that we really needed, okay? One of the things that they did uh, the mirrorless cameras, at least, is they had the ability to go to silent shutter, a true silent shutter that didn't make any noise. And because I photographed a lot of events where speakers were speaking and these were in auditoriums that had excellent, excellent sound control, my camera shutter from my Nikon D300, oh my goodness, that thing was like, it was like somebody was smacking something's butt cheeks. Okay, every single time you took a picture. It was really annoying. <laughs> it, it ticked the staff off quite often. So yeah, the uh, the EM5 was really close. And if, if I had been there long enough, I would have probably switched the, the college over when the EM1 came out. Uh, now, now I have, I have two OM1s and I'm still Olympus. And today, you know, I still see reasons to stick with four thirds, you know. So, so here's an example. Uh, we're going to clear the table here and I'm going to bring some prints in because you shouldn't be looking at pictures on screen. Look at pictures, they're printed. All right, so this was another government project and once again, okay, the same thing happened each time. We had some other photographer come in, they took pictures, they were using a Nikon D750 and, and I'm not bashing Nikon here, okay? No. So this right here is the entirety of what the picture is to look like once it was cropped, all right? I don't know how well you can see it. I'm not gonna bother tilting it up. But that is the blurry mess that we got. Okay, what happened? <laughs> get, get, get this, get this. This right here, my coworker went and took a better picture with his cell phone. This was sharper. It's pixelated, of course, because it's not the, as many megapixels as the Nikon D750, but you know, it was sharper. So, so here's my picture, okay? Done with the high res mode on the tripod. Okay, why? why? Why is this the situation? Okay, why? This flies in the face of everything that you've probably heard on the internet. Okay, it's pretty simple. The bigger formats have less depth of field. The guy with the D750 had to crank the aperture down so close that basically diffraction limit started. And as a result, the entire image was a blurry mess. So yeah, there are, there are uses, okay? There are good applications for smaller sensors when you need greater depth of field. And this is something that people don't realize is that when you blow things up really big, okay? Cause, cause this print, this print's like 12 foot, okay? When it's all done. When you print something that big, well, yeah, you've got to have an enormous amount of depth of field. And this has happened twice to me now. There was another time we had to photograph uh, a document for, it was the state's constitution essentially. And they wanted it at a specific angle and it needed to be sharp all the way through. And I actually, we actually talked about renting a medium format camera or some of the 35 mm camera that would have enough pixels in order to blow this thing up 16 feet. And we just ended up using one of my cameras because this had more depth of field. And because when I was looking at the math of how deep the depth of field would be, it's like, well, if I close down the aperture more, then we'd hit the diffraction limit. And, and by the way, folks, diffraction starts as a result of a ratio of the aperture to the focal length. It has nothing to do with conversion formats, okay? You know, those, those idiots out there that say, well, that's actually F35 or F45 and 35 millimeter. Well, no. F2.8 on four thirds is still F2.8. F8 is still F8 
as far as the diffraction limit goes because the diffraction limit starts as a result of a ratio of the optics. It has to do with the angle of the light that's going in. It has nothing to do with what its equivalent aperture is. Okay, I'm so sick and tired of hearing equivalence, equivalence because it's used incorrectly. But yeah, so this, this is another reason why I still use Olympus is because when I need more megapixels, uh, pretty much every single time it's been a static target for me. And yeah, I've been able to create a really, really nice print like that. That is, you look at that, you can see every detail on the brush strokes that were on the Civil War flag. And it was sharp from top to bottom. Okay, even though I was at a very slight angle because of how I had to be able, had to photograph it. You know, we, we both were basically handicapped at photographing this thing at a slight angle. So, so yeah, there's just kind of my honest, you know, this is why I use four thirds, just because for me, it has always worked. It has always been completely adequate and I have never really had it let me down except for that one time when I was at college and I was staff photographer full time. But yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of the only situation where I kind of said, no, let's wait. And sure enough today, sensors are good enough folks that, you know, there's pretty much nothing you don't, you can't do with a 20 megapixel sensor these days. This is plenty of resolution for me. And I've heard people say they need more resolution, but usually they're cropping really heavy. And by the way, if you try and crop a 35 mm sensor, you're gonna have the same problem. I now have two OM1s. And, and here's one other reason why I've never switched camera systems. Every time I've thought about it, and there's been a couple times I've thought about it, there was, there was a few times when Sony, uh, in its early days, when they had just taken over Minolta, I, I contemplated switching to Sony. There were a few times when I contemplated switching over to Contax back in the film days. You know, but every single time I've thought about switching cameras, I think to myself, okay, I look at the I look at the finance differences, how much it's going to cost me to to trade in my gear, and what's going to cost to get the new gear. And from a dollar's perspective, it always kind of made sense, and I can see why. If you think in that respect only, yeah, you're going to jump camera systems every single year. But really, you're stupid if you do. And I see people do that. I see people change camera systems every year, and they're stupid. Okay. And here's here's the big elephant in the room cost that nobody ever takes into account, okay? And that's the amount of time it takes you to learn a new camera. If you calculate that cost in, it's not worth it. It has never been worth it. That's why I've always kind of stuck with Olympus is because every single time I looked at the amount of time that I would have to spend reading new manuals, learning the camera, going out and practicing photos, and just memorizing the controls of a whole new camera, every single time, it's not worth it. it it's too expensive. And the benefits of maybe that tiny little bit of extra performance that we get in one area versus another, it just completely wasn't worth it. And that's why, like, like when I went to college, even though the Nikon was better for certain things that we were doing at the time, I still personally stuck with Olympus because me switching over my own personal gear and everything, after I calculated in the cost difference and the cost of my time, because your time should be valuable to you, well, then it wasn't worth it anymore. And that's kind of one of the reasons why you shouldn't change cameras every single year. I mean, look at Tony North, or good grief, that guy's changed cameras six times in the time that I've been following him. Six freaking times. <sighs> yeah, there's no way you can become proficient with your gear having changed equipment that often. Spend time memorizing your gear. Spend time learning how to use your gear. That is going to go a lot farther into making you a better photographer than getting that tiny little bit of extra performance that you might get out of some other camera. Yeah, hope you thought this was interesting, okay? And uh, 
yeah, I still use mostly four thirds gear. I probably will almost always use mostly four thirds gear on my smaller equipment. Someday I will probably get a 35 millimeter sensor, maybe even a medium format for astrophotography, but that's when I've got like a 20 inch Richie Crichton in my dome. <laughs> All right, take care everybody.